Thank you to Absinthe Alice, Amethyst, Amet, Caroline, Christina Smith, Deborah Tychus, Elizabeth Watkins, If in Doubt, Flat Out, Karen Parrett, Kat, Lindsay Pruitt, Melissa Berwick, Mila, Nika Parsons, and the new Ongome 24. Mr. Mulhaven was a great man. A great man. The old woman who was renting the house wagged her finger as though she was scolding me, though I had no idea why. I nodded agreeably and murmured that I was sure he was, but Mrs. Abrams was already heading into another room filled with empty bookshelves and talking at me again. When my Hugo built this place, it was the idea that we might one day want to live here instead of the big house. She gestured across the road to the massive Tudor-style mansion that loomed there. She glanced at me and waved her hand at the floor and walls. You know, less to clean, less to heat, and all on one floor. She pointed a finger at me. You young people, you don't think about such things. But when you get old and stiff, small is better. Her face softened as she gave me a shrugging smile. But things are never what you expect. My husband's gone now, and I can't stand the thought of not living where I remember him. I felt a deep pang of sympathy for her, but I wasn't sure what to say. Before I could think of anything, she was going again. Mr. Mulhaven was such a blessing when he came on as a tenant. He was quiet, clean, never complained, or she shot me a look before glancing around the room again. Through loud parties, and he was always early with his rent. When he went missing, her face tightened into a scowl. It was a tragedy, and not just for me. She caught my eye again. He was a great scientist, you see. A genius. Abrams led me into a slightly sunken den, the room accessible on one side by three steps and on the other by a gently sloping ramp. She pointed to the ladder. See? My Hugo thought of everything. He was so good with his hands, did some of the work himself. Gesturing to the large sectional sofa, she went on. As the ad says, it comes furnished. This was all extra stuff I had in storage, and when Mr. Mulhaven came, he didn't have anything but a suitcase and boxes of books and equipment. She raised an eyebrow and added, All of his effects are in storage, just in case he returns. I saw my opening to ask a question that had bugged me since I saw the ad. Um, Mrs. Abrams, I was going to ask about that. The thing in the paper said the rental was terminate at will by owner. Any remaining rent will be returned at a prorated rate. Are you saying month to month, or... The woman frowned at me. No. I mean what I say. If I don't like you, you're gone the next day. If you're too loud, dirty, you're out. And if Mr. Mulhaven ever does come back, it goes without saying that the house will go back to him if he wants it again. Her tone was less sharp as she went on. That's why the rent is so cheap, you understand. It's a big place, a nice place for so little. But if I say you go, you gather your things and you go. If you can't agree with that, I understand. She gave me a small smile. I'm sure I'll find someone who will for such a good deal. I was already shaking my head. It was weird, and it might bite me in the ass, but she was right. It was dirt cheap and seemed awesome, particularly since I had very little furniture of my own, and it wasn't like I had seen any other place half as good. No, no, I'm lucky to have found it. If you're willing to give me a shot, I'll take it. I had been there two months before I found out what was under the bed. When I say under, I mean just that. Like the rest of the house, the floor underneath the bed had been immaculately clean when I moved in, and I would wound up sliding my suitcase underneath after emptying them into a large wardrobe standing guard at the far side of the master bedroom. 
It was only when I was pulling one out to go visit my sister that I realized that something had gouged a large cut in the top of the bag. Not wanting to give up the storage space, but not wanting to mess up anything further, I grabbed a light and slid under the bed. There was plenty of space. The bed was a massive four-poster monstrosity that looked like it underneath. I saw a jagged piece of box spring poking out down toward the floor. That was what had cut my suitcase. I was about to slide out to get some pliers when my light caught something hidden between the springs of the bed frame and the mattress itself. Two somethings, actually. They were books. The first was a very old and weathered book with a gray leather cover. I was excited at first. It was like something out of a movie. Maybe it would be some strange ancient text filled with mysteries that I could unlock. If not, maybe it was worth a lot of money. I felt a pang of guilt at that. It probably belonged to either Mrs. Abrams or the science guy who used to live in the house. But if it did belong to him, was it really stealing? She wouldn't say much about it, but I knew that last year Mulhaven had just vanished. And if he was really gone, he didn't really have claim to the stuff he left behind, did he? Setting aside any moral debate or justification, I looked closer at the book in the fading afternoon light. The cover was embossed, but it was so faded I could just barely make out the words at all. And it looked like... Fuck, what was that, French? Gingerly flipping through the book confirmed that the brittle yellow pages were all filled with uneven type that seemed to be a mixture of French and Latin. Muttering to myself, I pulled out my phone. Maybe I could at least translate the title and see if it was worth... Two hours had passed since I went under the bed. Blinking... My first thought was that my phone was messed up. There was no way that it had taken more than ten minutes for me to find the bent spring, see the books, lift up the mattress enough to rake them out. But when I looked at my alarm clock and the microwave, they confirmed the time had passed. Looking outside, I could tell the sun was lower, too, which meant I really had lost time. It also meant I was late leaving for my sisters. I threw clothes into my suitcase quickly and was about to close it when I hesitated. I still hadn't looked at the second book. Picking it back up, I saw it was just a notebook, a journal of some kind, and all the pages looked blank. I thought about leaving the books behind, but I wanted to look at them closer, maybe even show them to my sister. Feeling a bit like a thief, I packed them into my bag and headed out. It's called The Fragilities of Time and Space by some dude named Alexander Trudeau. Or at least that's what I think it's called. If I'm reading it right and the internet has translated it correctly. Lena glanced away from her tablet to cock an eyebrow at me. You're not keeping it, right? She hesitated before going on. I mean, it's not yours. You need to give it to your landlady. I frowned at my sister. <sighs> yeah, yeah, I know. I will. I I'm just looking at it now, okay? I thought it was neat. She looked slightly relieved and nodded. It is. And the other book. It's empty? I laughed at her. You make it sound like a bucket, but yeah, it's empty, or I think it is. Picking it up, I sat it between us on the coffee table and slowly flipped through its white pages from front to back and then front. See? Nothing. Just a bunch of blank- Wait, what's, what's that on the inside cover? I looked up at my sister and then back down at the journal. She was right. On the inside of the front hardcover was a dark red mark, or... It was a fingerprint. I turned the book in the light of a nearby table lamp. 
I could see the rust-colored ridges and whorls of someone's fingertip, or given its size and shape, maybe the pad of a thumb. Laughing, I turned it toward Lena. <laughs> Freaky. Maybe they're going to write goth poetry in it or something. Looking at the fingerprint again, I gently probed at it with my own thumb. Hey, well, don't touch it. I smirked at her. I think it's safe. It's probably paint or ink anyway. Then I wrinkled her nose. Fuck that. It looks like blood to me. Either way, it's gross. Go wash your hands. Rolling my eyes, I sat the book down. <sighs> Bossy bitch. She shot me the look that always made me feel like a little kid, even at 28. Just do it. It could be infected or something. You don't know who's had that thing or where it's been. It was weird, sleeping in a strange bed that night. I just started getting used to the bed back at my new house, and that was before I'd known I was laying on top of an old French book and someone's bloody fingerprint. I glanced over at the moonlit silhouette of the book stacked on the nightstand. People were so fucking strange. Maybe that Molehaven had been some sort of smart science guy, but so far, it seemed like he was just a class A weird... Scritch. Scritch. What the fuck was that? I sat up and turned on the light, looking around for the sign of something moving. A bug or mouse, maybe? But nothing was out of place, or skittering away, and the noise had sounded close by. Maybe it was because I'd been looking at it, but... I would have sworn the sound came from that nightstand. I glanced around the table. Nothing. Just a clock, a lamp, and... Well, the books. Tensing up for a roach to dart out, I picked up the fertilities of time and space and then the notebook. Still nothing. I sat the French book back down and was about to put the other on top when I hesitated. Where had that sound come from? Could it be something between the pages? I held the book out away from me and the bed as I opened it, and my eyes went back immediately to the red thumbprint on the inner corner. How'd I miss that before? It was so obvious, and it was so weird that it was the only... There was writing on the first page now. Scratched out in thin gray letters that might be faded pencil or ghostly pale ink, it still jumped out on the stark white of the page. That hadn't been there before. I knew it, and knowing that made it hard to breathe. Just a small change, just a single word, a greeting, maybe an invitation. Hello. Hello? Who is this? My voice was barely above a whisper, and I wondered if I'd be able to hear a response over the pounding of my heart. I was staring at the page, but was tensed for any sound or emotion from any corner of the shadowy bedroom. As the seconds crawled by, my mind began trying to weakly interject that maybe it was nothing after all. Maybe the word had been there already and we just hadn't... No, that was bullshit. Maybe, maybe I'd missed the fingerprint or a thumbprint or whatever it was, but not the writing on the very first page. Plus there had been that sound, which I now imagined was the sound of some ghost pencil scritch scratching the greeting to me. Maybe that was it. I needed to write back instead of talking to it like it was a fucking smartphone. I checked the bedside table's drawers, but they were empty aside from a TV remote and an old phone charger. Then I remembered that I might still have a pin from the last time I'd used my suitcase. It had been a work trip, and I thought I'd cram some miscellaneous pins and notepads into one of the side pockets. Sure enough, I found two plastic ball points squirreled away underneath some socks and underwear. Heart still thundering, I went back to the bed and picked up the notebook with a pin in hand. 
Hello? Who is this? I sat for close to ten minutes, waiting for a response. But there was none. Finally giving up, I put the book back on the nightstand and, leaving the light on, tried to go back to sleep. That was easier said than done. I was waiting to hear that scratching sound again, and more than once I flipped open the book to make sure something hadn't been silently written in response to my question. It wasn't until after the sun was starting to peek in my window that I finally fell back to sleep. Well, you look like dog shit. I snickered at Lena. <laughs> Good morning to you too. She snorted. <laughs> Good morning. Passed you half an hour ago. I was going to let you sleep another half hour and then come check if you were dead. I glanced at the microwave, then back at her. <sighs> shit. My bad. I didn't mean to sleep that long. I I'm sorry. She waved the apology. No biggie. Just get dressed and let's grab some lunch. I know a good taco bar you'll like, and I'm starving. Thirty minutes later, we were stuffing our faces between telling each other funny and irritating stories from our respective jobs. Lena was a pediatrician, and I was a marketing analyst at a PR firm, so you'd think our stories would be wildly different from each other. And some were, of course, but most of them weren't that far apart. Because at the end of the day, the stories were about people. And at the end of the day, most people just weren't that comp... Make sure you give that stuff back, okay? I glanced up at Lena, confused both by what she'd said and the worried look on her face. She frowned slightly as she waggled her fingers at me to ward off something distasteful. The books. The weird books you found. Make sure you give them to that lady as soon as you get back. I shot her a dark look. Lena, I shoplifted once. Once. And I was 15 at the time. It was a stupid kid move, okay? Jesus, I'm not some fucking thief, and I don't need you mother hinting me about it. My sister looked ready to argue, but instead she took a deep breath and nodded. You're right, and I'm not saying you'd keep it. It's more... I don't know. I, I kept thinking about them last night, and today. They creep me out. She shot me an embarrassed smile. You know me. I don't believe in all that spooky shit, but... That's what made this so weird. I let out a small laugh. I hope sounded genuine. <laughs> Lena, there's nothing to them. Just some old books in a weird journal or whatever. When she didn't look convinced, I added, But, yeah. I'll give them to Mrs. Abrams as soon as I get back. She nodded, looking slightly relieved. Good. I was close to mentioning the writing I'd seen the night before when Lena spoke up again. You know, I almost woke you up last night and asked you to go put those books back in your car. She blushed a little. The idea of them in the house kind of makes my skin crawl. Stupid as that is. I felt a mixture of guilt and worry curdling in my belly. I looked at the notebook again that morning, but there was still nothing beyond that initial hello and my response. Now, I definitely wasn't telling her about it. It would only make her worry more, but the fact that she was worried somehow spooked me more than the strangeness of the writing itself. Because she was right. She didn't buy into anything otherworldly, and she didn't scare easily. Whatever was going on with the book, I needed to stay out of it and get it away from me as soon as possible. When I left my sister's that afternoon, I had every intention of giving Mrs. Abrams the book when I made it home. It wasn't until I stopped for gas along the way that I decided I should check the book one last time. I pulled the notebook out of my bag feeling my hands tingling slightly as I flipped open the cover. Hello. Hello? Who is this? Albert Mulhaven. I need... I fumbled with the book as my hands began to shake. 
gripping it tighter, I moved over to be more directly under one of the bright white lights above the gas pumps. That's what it said, in gray letters like the first, but newly written since I'd packed up the notebook a couple of hours earlier. Lena was right. There was something wrong with all this. I needed to give it to Abrams and be done. Still, that voice of reason in my head lacked conviction. And by the time I reached the house, I found myself turning into my own driveway instead of Abrams across the street. I'd just sleep on it, I told myself. Sleep on it and... Well, maybe see if he'd write back if I wrote again. A knock on my window made me jump. Looking up, I saw a teenage boy with long hair and swarms of acne on both cheeks staring at me unhappily. I only rolled the window down far enough to ask what he wanted. Looking irritated, he looked back at his phone before glancing up at me. Uh, is this 129 Cypress Lane? I shook my head. No, this is 130. I think 129 is my landlady's house. The big one across the road? I pointed in the general direction of the other house. Did you try there yet? Nah, not yet. Uh, sir, thanks for the help. He was turning to walk back toward the road, and glancing in my rear view, I could see an old, beat-up green hatchback parked on the shoulder next to my driveway. The kid looked harmless enough, but it still seemed odd. I don't remember ever seeing anyone over at Abram's house in the time that I'd lived across from her, and it wouldn't hurt to make sure he had some legitimate reason for bothering her. Hey, why are you looking for that house? The boy stopped in his tracks, another irritated look passing across his face briefly before he could hide it. Groceries. I drop off groceries for customers, but I've never been out here before, so... He shrugged. Anyway, I gotta get to it. Thanks. Nodding absently, I watched in the rear view as he trundled back to his car and drove over to the big house across the road. True to his word, he came back out of the car carrying what looked like several plastic bags of groceries as he made his way to the large front door. Satisfied that he wasn't up to anything nefarious, I grabbed my own bags and went inside. I wanted to write something back right away, but held off. I needed to be careful with this, and I didn't want to waste time with stupid questions. He said he was Mulhaven. Fair enough. But what did that mean? How was Mulhaven writing through the book? Was it some kind of science experiment gone wrong? Was he a ghost? Was the book some kind of weird, old-fashioned looking, but actually high-tech tablet or something? I wanted answers to all of these questions, but in the end, I decided to focus on what he already said. What do you need? I was staring at the book, waiting for a response when I heard a quiet but sharp rapping at my door. Much like in the car, I jumped, but this time I almost ignored it. I wanted to be looking when the response came. Did it get written out by an unseen hand, or did it just fade in like the old spy ink I used to have as a kid? There was another knock. Muttering to myself, I pulled out my phone and propped it to where the camera would see the page before pressing record. It wasn't the best angle or lighting, but it would have to do. If it was that stupid kid again. It wasn't. When I opened the door, I saw Mrs. Abrams standing out there, hot and flustered. I raised an eyebrow as I took a step back. Hey, are you okay? You seem a bit out of breath. She wiped a damp string of hair on her forehead and gave me a smile. No, no, I'm fine. I had food delivered and just finished putting it all where it needed to go. She raised thin, black-penciled eyebrows at me. That's why I came over here, actually. I was going to invite you for dinner tomorrow night. I'll make a roast. I tried to hide my confusion. 
I'd hardly exchanged more than 10 minutes of conversation with Abram since the day I moved in. Why was she suddenly inviting me to come eat with her? There's no need to go through trouble like that. I... She was shaking her head. No, no, nonsense. It's no trouble, and I'll enjoy the company. Besides, you're a good tenant, and I think that deserves something. Abrams cut her eye toward me and chuckled. Even if it's only a bit of overly dry meat. I nodded awkwardly, and apparently satisfied, Abrams said goodnight and told me to come over at seven before ambling back the way she came. Closing the door, I glanced back to the living room where the notebook still lay open. Was it my imagination, or was something new written there? Walking fast, I went back toward the... I woke up on the floor next to the coffee table. Had I fallen or passed out? Reaching for my phone, I saw that it was after midnight. It had been, what, nine or so when Abrams had come over? And then I'd shut the door and seen the notebook and was going to check to see if there was anything new written in it because it had looked like there was and... There was. Just another single word. Meat. What does that mean? Meat? The paper of the journal stayed silent for the next two hours, and finally I was too exhausted to stare at it any longer. I considered carrying the notebook with me to bed, but something recoiled at the idea. This was all too strange, and while I was still largely preoccupied by the wonder and mystery of it all, I couldn't help but feel a sense of unease, too. I didn't know what I was dealing with. Not really. What if it was dangerous? What if I... My eyes snapped open and I could see the sunlight coming in through my bedroom windows. I'd slept past eleven, even though I'm usually awake before nine. Even then, I felt like I could have slept on and probably would have if not for the cold bit of metal digging against my cheek. Lifting my head, I looked groggily back down at my pillow. It was a key. A small, brass key. Like you sometimes saw on lock boxes or roll-top desks. Sitting up quickly, I looked around the room for other signs of an intruder, but I didn't see any. Just this tiny key that had somehow been slipped onto my pillow like a bizarre tooth fairy. I picked it up gingerly, as though I thought it might shock or bite me if I didn't handle it with care. Turning it over in my hand, I saw no markings or labels, and it didn't seem remarkable in any way. Just three jagged teeth defined by the valleys of planned metal that separated them into tiny, isolated islands of brass. I blinked and realized I'd just been staring at the key for some time. What was wrong with me? I looked at the clock and saw that it was nearly noon now. I had work to get done. And then there was that weird dinner invitation from Abrams if I actually decided to go. The idea of begging off was very tempting, but something in me resisted the idea. Aside from not wanting to be rude or alienate a landlord that could toss me out at a moment's notice, I also wondered if I could find out more about the man that had lived there before me. She certainly seemed to think a lot of him, and she'd gone through all of his stuff. Maybe she knew something about his work. Still, the idea of being in that house with her made me uncomfortable. I glanced down at the key nestled in my palm. Just like all this was. I put the key on my nightstand and wiped my hand on my shorts absently as I wandered into the living room. My excitement at checking the notebook was tainted by fear and uncertainty now. But I still made myself look before getting ready to go out. 
When I flipped over the cover, my eyes found the last word written in faded gray letters, still unchanged from the night before. It's an old family recipe, though I jazzed up the ingredients over time. Mrs. Abrams shot me a sly look. Maybe if you're good to me, I'll teach it to you. I shifted uncomfortably on the floral sofa she led me to when I arrived a few minutes earlier as I gave a small laugh. <laughs> I'm no cook, but it does smell good. She smiled at me, the red lipstick on her lips crawling up toward eyes that seemed to sparkle with a light I hadn't noticed before. You'd be surprised what you can learn if you put your mind to it. Tipping me a wink, she gestured toward the kitchen. I've still got to finish up in here, so you just go sit here and relax. She put her hand on her hips, smoothing out the black velvet of the dress she was wearing. And if you can think of anything you want, just let me know. I nodded and tried to keep my expression neutral as she left the room. What the fuck? Was she fucking flirting with me? I was used to the amiable attention that I sometimes got from older women, but this? She was made up more than I'd ever seen, and while she didn't really look younger than her 70-ish years, there was a weird energy to her now that gave everything a different feel than just an old woman looking to mother a young tenant. Shaking my head, I glanced toward the kitchen where I could hear her opening what sounded like an oven. I was being stupid, right? Or... Even if I wasn't misreading things, wasn't it a little bit sexist of me to be grossed out about it? I mean, what if I was an older man being a little flirty with a younger woman? Would I think it was so weird? And it wasn't like she'd done anything out of the way, at least not yet. I needed to chill the fuck out and... That's when my eyes landed on the roll-top desk sitting in the far corner of the living room. I froze, as though I was being caught in the act of well, something by just seeing the piece of furniture. It looked almost identical to the image that had come to mind when I'd found that key that morning. It was bound to be a coincidence, like one of those instances of fake deja vu that your mind convinces you is real, but once I saw the desk, I found it hard to keep my gaze from wandering back to it. Glancing in the direction of the kitchen, I heard the sound of metal clattering. If I was going to do more than look at it, now was my best chance. Odds were, it just was full of old person crap, but it would satisfy the buzzing curiosity in the base of my skull. At least I could refocus my attention on fending off any awkward advances from Abrams while not pissing her off. Standing up slowly, I casually meandered over to that corner of the room, pretending to look at a picture of willows hanging on the wall and a small collection of porcelain figurines clustered in a display case next to the roll top. Glancing around one last time, I focused my attention on the roll top itself. The ribbed lid was all the way down, and just below a small brass knob was a keyhole one that looked the same size as the key I'd found. I felt my heart sink. I'd left it on the nightstand. Still, it wouldn't hurt to try the lid. It was probably just a normal desk, unrelated to anything, which meant it probably wasn't even... Naughty boy. I jumped and spun around to see Mrs. Abrams behind me. This close, I could smell flowery, too sweet perfume covering a deeper, sour smell. She smiled at me with yellow teeth. I, I was, I was just... She chuckled. <laughs> you were poking around. It's okay. Curiosity killed the cat. Her lips pursed into a smirk. But satisfaction brought him back. I took a step back and shoveled to the side as her eyes drifted down to the desk. You won't get into there, I'm afraid. It's locked up tight to protect some of Albert's papers. Her eyes found mine again. Delicate matters. Swallowing, I nodded. 
uh, yeah, sure. I, maybe I should just, turning away, she beckoned for me to follow. In any case, dinner's ready. It's time to eat. When I hesitated, she glanced back with a raised eyebrow. Come on, before the meat gets cold. The next hour was one of the most uncomfortable of my life. Abrams acted more normal at the dinner table, but I couldn't shake feeling exposed, as though she was constantly weighing me in some way I didn't understand. She did most of the talking, primarily asking me questions about where I was from and what I did for work, while occasionally pausing to ask if I was enjoying the food. And I said yes, of course, though it wasn't hard to be convincing. The meal was actually very good, and... The roast had tender spiciness that was offset by sautéed potatoes and steamed asparagus. It was the first home-cooked meal I'd had in years. And between its flavor and my nervousness, I cleaned my plate before I realized it. Abrams offered me coffee in the living room, but the idea of settling back into that flower print sofa with her sitting so close unnerved me. Making up the excuse that I had to get up early the next day, I thanked her for the delicious meal and started heading toward the door. My eyes stole a glance at the desk again as I walked through the living room. The significance of what she said was in there hadn't been lost on me, and the desire to open it up and search for clues about Mulhaven only grew stronger as I got closer to escaping whatever weirdness Abrams might have planned. She didn't argue with my rushed farewell. Smiling serenely as she stepped forward to give me a lingering peck on the cheek as I turned to say goodbye at the door. I smiled awkwardly at the gesture and told her goodnight again before turning and heading back across the road at something just short of a trot. My mind was racing. I wanted to get into that desk, but how? Did I really want to go back over there? Wouldn't that just be encouraging her? A few minutes later, as I was rubbing her ruby lipstick off my cheek and brushing my teeth, I started considering the idea of going back in there without being invited. Not to bother anything, of course. Just to see if I could open the desk, poke around in there, and then get back out. The thing was, Abrams never seemed to leave our house. Not that I always paid a lot of attention, but I'd never noticed her car gone in the time I'd lived there. And if I wasn't willing to go over there for another awkward dinner date, what other chance would I have? (sighs) Sighing with frustration, I went into the living room to check the journal before heading to bed. It was nothing new. Hell, maybe it was done. And would that be a bad thing? I wasn't sure anymore. After a moment's consideration, I carried the notebook back into the bedroom with me. I still wasn't sure I wanted it so close while I slept, but it did seem to write when I was close by. Maybe I'd wake up and it would give me some hint or clue as to what I should do or what was going on. If only I could see in that desk. If only she left the house or I had some way of knowing when it was safe to go have a... I jumped slightly as I awoke to a familiar sound next to me. Scritch. Scritch. Fumbling for the light, I grabbed up the notebook from the nightstand, knocking the small key to the floor in the process. Palms sweaty, I flipped open to the cover to see two new words written on the lowest line. It's time. I knew what he meant right away. Maybe in the same strange way I'd pictured the roll top just as it had been in Abram's house. We were connected somehow, uh, tied together by whatever had happened to him or whatever he wanted me to find. Maybe I could save him somehow. Or maybe he was trying to save me. Either way, the path was clear. I needed to get what was in that desk, and I needed to trust that he was right on the timing of it all. My conviction wavered as I crossed the moonlit road back to the shadows of Abram's monolithic home. 
It was the middle of the night, and her car was still there, so I had to assume she was inside. I was really going to break into this woman's house in the middle of the night, even if only for a few minutes, to peek inside the desk. What if she was awake and caught me? What if she had a gun? I tried to push the thought away. I'd be quiet. And if I heard or saw any sign of her being up, I'd just ease out before she saw me. And failing that, well, I could always act like I'd come over to uh, see if she wanted to have that coffee. I paused on the top step. Was this really worth all the potential hassle? And did I really want to risk entangling myself more with this odd woman? Just then, a new thought pushed its way into my mind. An intruder. I could tell her that I'd come in because I saw an intruder prowling around outside. And then... Then, before I could call her or the police, they'd entered the house. Fearing for her safety, I'd just run over to try and get her out before she got hurt. That sounded better, but how would I explain how I got in? No, this was all too much. I could feel the drive to go on, pushing me forward, but I resisted it. As interesting as all this was, I really didn't want to go to jail over something that was none of my business. And while I liked the excuse of trying to protect her, the only way it would work is if I could get in without breaking anything. I felt a nervous rumble at the thought. Not at the thought of breaking in, but at the realization that I had been considering it a likely option on the way across the road. There was always the chance I could find an unlocked door or window, but Abrams didn't strike me as an absent-minded or careless person. And yet I hadn't hesitated in coming over anyway, all because some words scratched on a page told me so. If that even was what it meant. I stood on the porch in a silver penumbra of moonlight, shadow draping my back like an unknown passenger and my heart thudding in my ears. What was I doing? I needed to go. I tried to retreat, but something held me back. I'd come that far, hadn't I? And this might be my only chance. Shouldn't I at least try the door? It was a stupid thought. Then I felt fear and anger welling up inside my chest as I gingerly reached out to test the front door's ornate latch. My stomach plummeted. As it went down at the lightest touch, the door swinging slightly open before I could pull my hand away. I cursed myself as I stepped inside, but much of my fear was gone now. I was like a sleepwalker, moving steadily through the dark to the living room and to the locked desk in its far corner. The key found it home easily in the black and it turned smoothly when I twisted it to the right. Pulse thrumming, I slid the top of the desk upward with a soft ratcheting that still caused me to freeze as I glanced around momentarily. Nothing. No sign of anyone being alerted or even awake. Shielding the light with my hand, I used my phone's screen to softly illuminate the desk's interior. I was worried I'd be looking through a rat's nest of papers or personal effects, but it was nothing like that. The walnut paneling was clean and bare, except for a single notebook resting at the desk's center. I felt a moment of disorienting confusion at the sight of it. It looked just like the book I'd left back in my bedroom. It wasn't until I lifted the cover that I saw the front page was filled with lines of blue ink instead of just a handful of gray words. Closing the book, I debated what to do. I could stay here and look at it, but I risked being exposed or not, getting a good look at the book. 
I took it, it may very well be missed, but I could always try to sneak it back in, and even if I couldn't, Abrams can never prove I was the one that took it. Clenching my teeth, I slid the book off the desk and eased the roll top down. There was a moment where I began turning away before I realized with a start I hadn't locked it back yet. Muttering at my stupidity, I reset the lock and crept back to the front door. The house was still quiet, and there were no lights on anywhere. A moan echoed from upstairs. I stopped dead at the sound, sure that it was the preamble of screams or gunfire or Abrams calling the police. But no. The moaning continued, low and throaty, and as I listened from the well of shadows below, I came to understand that I wasn't hearing the sounds of fear or distress at all. Suppressing a shudder, I opened the door and slipped out into the night. My sister, Alvena, was a big fan of journals. Personally, I thought they were a waste of time. Notes? Certainly. Formulas, computations, without question. But these were the tools of reason and logic. The planks and sails that carried the modern thinking man into new discoveries. Journals were for memories at best, and feelings and emotions at worst. All of them inconsistent things that usually served more as a means of servitude than an aid to elevation. I don't know that I disagree with that sentiment even now, yet here I am. My name is Albert Mulhaven, and this is my journal. I have two degrees in physics, have published dozens of papers, and among those who are honest, I'd be regarded as an expert in many areas, but most especially those dealing with time. I've argued the merits and flaws of different theories of when, for the past two decades, past hypothesis, block universe theory, casual set theory, etc., etc., ad infinitum. They were interesting, and at times I penned my hopes for true insight upon building from these ideas of others, using these structures of great scientific scholarship as the foundations upon which to build my temple. And yet, every time I began my labor in earnest, down one path or another, I found the materials to be woefully flimsy and brittle. Each was largely presupposition and guesswork, crudely shaped to fit a particular model or more established theory. And those models and theories were, in turn, more of the same. I began to feel the fruitlessness of my efforts, of all of our efforts. We were like children out camping, guessing the sources of the nighttime sounds that surrounded us, giving them names and weaving stories around them so to better assure ourselves we had a measure of understanding, protection, control, or perhaps worse. We were like the lowest of the prehistoric men, staring up at the sun and declaring it God. These realizations, these doubts, left me shaken. I left off my work for months, and during that time, I took to going on long walks that carried me far from home. It was during one of those I found my way into a pawn shop, and among those shelves I found an antique book dealing with the nature of time. It was all in French, but I bought it anyway. Something about it intrigued me, and it only took me a few weeks to be able to read it well enough. In my arrogant youth, I'd have dismissed it as a work of philosophy at best, or the superstitious ravings of primitive madmen at worst. But I was no longer that man, and the words of Alexander Trudeau renewed me, water to a man dying in a wasteland of self-doubt. His understanding of space-time was remarkably modern for a man who lived hundreds of years ago. 
He used different terms for some things. And of course, my translations were imperfect, but elements of a dozen modern theories lived in his work, all woven together by a brand of... He used different terms for some things, and of course, my translations were imperfect, but the elements of a dozen modern theories lived in his work, all woven together by a brand of mystic insight that pierced me within the first few pages. This wasn't a man who was guessing at the shape of truth in the dark. This was a man who'd seen truth and was now setting it on display for those with sense enough to seek it out. The book was unparalleled genius. Every principle and idea was explained clearly and well established before he moved on to the next. I was breathless by the end, and when I finished early one morning after two days with no sleep, I began from the beginning. After I knew it by heart, I began a new series of thought experiments and exercises. I was done with theories and hypotheses. I was going to touch the truth as Alexander had, I had to reach out with my own hand. I can't begin to do Alexander's truth justice here. I like the space and the language and, frankly, the mind. But I can summarize the most salient points of it as follows. Time is a lie. What we perceive as time are an infinite series of moments. Think of photographs or micrometer-thin slices of never-ending column of matter and energy. These slices are connected to each other in a multitude of ways and can be traveled by just as many. But we, as sentient creatures, already have one of the best and most efficient modes of travel built into our own very natures. Our consciousness, our true selves, travel through these moments with little effort, picture to picture, slice to slice, second by second. That motion, that inertia, gives the illusion of progress, of progression, of time. It's no different than animating a cartoon flipbook by fanning the pages. We're fooled by that motion into thinking it has more significance than it does, into thinking that time is real and that it defines us, defines everything. We have these bodies, these meat vessels that age and wither, and we assume it is just the hand of time wasting us as it does everything, never understanding that it isn't the time that matters. It's the meat. Our consciousness pushes us through these points of infinity, but it comes with a cost. We unknowingly slowly consume our physical bodies to maintain that inertia, and when the debt can no longer be paid, the body is left behind. For Trudeau, this was a matter of little consequence. This work was clearly part of a larger body of thought he had, one that was embarrassingly religious, if I'm honest, despite my deep respect for the man. His talk of other realms and nightlands, I suppose in those earlier times, even a genius such as he couldn't help but be infected by some degree of superstition. But the meat, the glorious meat, that was real enough. And while he didn't explicitly say it, the implication was there. If one could find a way to break the cycle, to free one's consciousness from barreling forward in this idiotic chronological pursuit, you could escape the lie of time and its consequences. It just required an open mind and enough energy to break the cycle and maintain one's sense of self without the rigid structure that sequential causality afforded lesser beings. The first time I ate a person, I felt those shackles slip away. It was terrifying at first. I felt as though I was being torn apart in a storm as I slipped into the dark between moments. But I'd prepared myself in mind and body. I was now a contradiction that could exist outside the borders of the so-called natural world. I was matter and not, energy and not, but always, if such a word has meaning, I was will 
and I was power. So I steadied myself. I learned the nature of living without the weight of time's lie on my neck. I found ways to travel to a multitude of moments, though initially my own mind provided limitations. I could only travel to places and times I was familiar with, you see. At first, that was enough. And when it wasn't, I sought more power to pierce this new threshold. I came back to life to feed, but I soon realized my methods were unrefined and inefficient. So much energy was wasted in going back and forth into the time stream with a belly full of blood and meat and pain. Again, I turned to my muse, Alexander, to his reference to connecting with higher, more ascended beings and being used by them. I dismissed it as a fancy at the time, but perhaps too quickly. Wasn't I a higher being now, after all? My first few tries were failures. It's a delicate thing, you see. Interweaving a thread of your own consciousness in with another's so completely that you gain sucker from them without having lips or teeth of your own. Mrs. Abrams was my first success. When she ate, I ate. And when she didn't, well, I still ate a little from time to time. It was a much better system. Still imperfect, and Mrs. Abrams had reached the end of her usefulness, I'm afraid. I piled her with fear and pleasure, gently milked her for all the life she has to give, all the meat she can consume in my name. But the process has been hard on her, and I can feel her beginning to slip away. That's why I had her place the ad. Except you as a tenant. Hid the books and the key. Give me enough hooks in your brain that I could burrow my way in. Make my thoughts your thoughts. My hungers your hungers. Prepare you to take her place. Even now you think this is crazy. You're confused and afraid. Considering whether or not you should even be reading any longer. Or if your time is better spent running away. I can assure you, there is no where or when to run to. But what would be the point? It's easier to just do this. Look up. I looked up from the page, letting out a startled scream at the naked figure before me. It was Mrs. Abrams, her skin gray and sagging like corpse flesh as she looked down at me with dull eyes. She'd seemed old before. Now she was ancient. A few white hairs nested on the top of her speckled skull, and when she smiled I could see black gums foaming around yellow mounds of time-worn bone. Forgive me. I know I look a mess. She croaked out the words with a brittle laugh. The bag boy we ate. He was filling, but my Albert is so terribly hungry as of late. Her roomy eyes rolled in her head as she gave a small shiver. Not that I mind. He's always so good to me. A black line of drool crept from the corner of her mouth as she stepped toward me. I shuffled back on my bed as I stared at her in horror. Bag boy? That who ate? Abrams snickered nastily. <laughs> you know well enough. You smacked your mouth on it, didn't you? She sniffled as she ran a long-nailed hand down her side. Could have had dessert, but that's your loss. Wiping at her mouth, she stared at the ceiling. Still, your first is always the best. I remember eating my Hugo. He was delicious. I took her momentary distraction as my chance to get away. Sliding off the bed, I hit my nightstand as my feet made it to the floor. 
The other notebook, the one I found under the bed, fell off the table and landed open next to me. I couldn't help but look down at it for a moment. I'd been so fucking stupid. These people were crazy and I was getting out of here. And Why couldn't I move? Why couldn't I run? I looked up in terrified frustration. I saw that Abrams was lying down on the floor, her eyes on some distant point as she began to thrash and groan. Again, I tried to move my feet, but it was no use. I was trapped in this nightmare. And why? What? What do you want me to do? The question wasn't to Abrams, but to the book, or at least to the thing behind it. I didn't really expect an answer, but as soon as I looked down to the page, I saw two new words forming below the last. To eat. I sucked in a breath as I glanced back at Abrams. I wanted to feel revulsion, but I didn't. All I felt was an intense, burning heat radiating out from my core. No. Not heat. Hunger. I looked back down at the book as though to ask another question to try and talk myself out of it. I saw now that my own words, the questions I'd asked, were all gone. All that was left were the gray words of the thing that lived outside of time but in it. Always ahead of me. But always following me one step behind. Hello, meat. It's time to eat. Stifling a laugh, I wiped spittle from my chin as I turned back to the feast laid out before me, and I fell to my knees. <laughs>